I'm going to give you some brief highlights of Brother David's life from 1926 to 2001. At the same time, I'm going to be showing you some images that may or may not correspond with what I am saying, but I think you're going to enjoy both um, the stories and the images. Born in Vienna, Austria on July 12, 1926, Franz Kuno was the oldest of three brothers. He was an adorable, precocious baby and toddler. When he was seven, his parents separated and his mother Elizabeth took the two younger boys to a small village in the Alps. And Franz, staying in Vienna with his father, who promptly sent Franz to boarding school, but not for long. His mother found out how miserable Franz was at that school and she kidnapped him and brought him home to the family. So here they are in the Alps. Franz spent all of his teen years under the Nazis. He was 12 when Hitler came into power in Austria and 19 when the occupation was ended in 1945. When they were back in Vienna those early years, the city and the houses were in shambles, food was scarce, and life and safety were unpredictable. The only thing that they could rely on was the priest coming through the houses at the same time every day serving communion. As Brother David said later, that meant something and continues to mean something to me. With all the problems I have with the institution, there was the institution at its best. With Hitler being against the church, Franz's adolescent revolt against the establishment meant going deeper into his Catholic faith. Around this time, he became interested in a little book that he found called The Rule of Saint Benedict. And with more acts of rebellion, he visited monasteries where he was really not allowed to go. He was drafted into Hitler's army, but luckily never sent to the front lines. He said he used all his drill and barracks time for uninterrupted prayer. And after undergoing frequent humiliations by his superiors, uh, he also cultivated this Christian duty of always questioning authority. Who said that and why? After several months of serving, he and two others escaped and his mother hid them at their home for three months until the end of the war. After the war, in the summer of 1945, he volunteered to work with the thousands of refugees flowing into Austria, helping to provide them with food, shelter, and a renewed sense of confidence. He entered the University of Vienna to resume his studies, majoring in art and then psychology, eventually earning a doctorate in psychology in 1953 with a minor in anthropology. I'm not exactly sure when he was a shepherd, but I love this photo. How old, do you know how old you were, Brother David, then? Do you know how old you were? 19, all right. <laughs> and from 1947 to 1945, he helped to publish a children's magazine in Vienna called Der Golden Wagen. Did your mother also work on that? Did you hear that? He, he was too young, really, to publish this book, but, so his mother had to legally edit it. So he had an amazing mother and grandmother. Both Franz's mother, whom his brothers called the Lion Mother, and his maternal grandmother, who was the first woman to ever speak on Austrian radio, were energetic activist women with what Brother David would describe as having that special woman's power, life-giving power that fosters new life and growth. After World War I, for instance, his grandmother worked to help war orphans and would come to the U.S. to raise funds, uh, coming to spend half of every year in the U.S. So, after World War II, having spent time here in the U.S., Franz's mother and brothers came to live here. Franz also visited the U.S. and Canada uh, several times during the early 50s. He's often said of this time that he was torn, you may have heard this before, finding the perfect girl or the perfect monastery. <laughs> Apparently, there were 
many good-looking, wonderful girls in Austria, but none of the monasteries that he knew of reflected the original teachings of St. Benedict that he had always kept in his thoughts. Then, on one of those trips to the U.S., someone told him about this new little monastery in Elmira, New York, that sounded like what he was looking for. So he hopped on a bus and then hitchhiked the rest of the way to Mount Savior Monastery and almost immediately joined that community and became Brother David. Soon, the abbot, and this was Father Damasus Winzen, right, Brother David? Father Damasus Winzen, could see that Brother David had some kind of talent for speaking and teaching, and he sent him out in the world to teach about monasticism. In that process, Brother David started reading about Buddhist monks. He read Dr. Suzuki's The Training of the Zen Buddhist Monk and discovered that they had little details out of the rule of St. Benedict. They didn't borrow it, really. It just happened to be the same thing. Fascinated by this, quote, common methodical effort to deepen our awareness of that reality which gives meaning to life, he received Vatican approval in 1967 and was sent by his abbot to participate in Buddhist Christian dialogue and live in a Buddhist monastery in New York for three years. So this began a really busy time of Buddhist Christian dialogue. He met with and was encouraged by both Thomas Merton and Thich Nhat Hanh. Interfaith dialogue continued with Swami Sachi Dananda and Rabbi Gelberman too, and in 1968, they formed the nonprofit the Spirit Center for Spiritual Studies, which also included Ido Roshi, Pir Vilayat Inyat Khan, Yogi Bhajan, and Sri Shinmoy. He also met often with Rabbi Zalman Schachter, and in 1975, Brother David received the Martin Buber Award for achievement in building bridges between religious traditions. There he is with Swami Sachi Dananda. I love that photo. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Brother David was actively involved in civil rights and peace movements and the development of communities. Together with Thomas Merton, Brother David ignited a renewal of religious life. In the 70s, he was a leading figure in the House of Prayer movement. This movement affected more than 200,000 members of the religious orders across the United States and Canada. It emphasized renewing one's spiritual life through prayer and spiritual practices, something he's been a proponent of throughout his life. He helped Peter Stewart found Thanksgiving Square in Dallas, Texas, a place of inclusion and diversity, devoted to the spirit and to all that which, bring, that which brings us outside and beyond ourselves. It was at the encouragement of Peter Stewart there that Brother David carved out time in 1982 as a guest at Peter's house to write Gratefulness, the Heart of Prayer. Brother David has written several books, two published just this summer that you saw here tonight. I think he's writing a couple more right now. And he's co-written several others with writers such as Fritjof Capra, Robert Aiken, and Sharon LaBelle, and has contributed to countless other books. During the 1980s to mid-1990s, Brother David lived in different spiritual communities from Maine to California. And I'm not sure where this was taken. Do you know where that was, Brother David? Big Sur. Well, I was pretty close. Uh, while he was living at the new Kamaldoli Hermitage in California, he was asked to fill in for a teacher at Esalen. And he, of course, said yes. You know, he would do that, and he would come right over. Finding out once that he arrived that the talk was entitled, and I couldn't get, he was talk, it was entitled something like, The Trouble with Catholicism. <laughs> Wait, was that the right title? Yeah? Oh, I got it right. I can't believe it. Um, most of my notes come from things that Brother David's written on the, um, in articles off the website and from a book that Claire Hallward wrote called um, Essential Writings of Brother David. And some come from things that I kind of remember him saying, and that was one of them. He's been teaching at Esalen every year since, and Tassajara too. He came to, back to upstate New York to live in Hermitage in Ithaca, New York, 1997, which is where I got to meet him in, 1995, in 2005. So the basic rhythm of Brother David's life has been living as a hermit for half the year, and the other half traveling and offering retreats, 
teaching with colleagues and lecturing. Indeed, he has taught all over the world and continues to do so. He, this is from Claire's book. He buoyantly gives himself to all people, whether his audience consists of starving students in Zaire or faculty at Harvard and Columbia universities, Buddhist monks or Sufi retreatants, Papago Indians or German intellectuals, New Age commune visitors or naval cadets at Annapolis, missionaries on Polynesian islands or Green Berets or participants at international peace conferences. In the late 1990s, Brother David met a young student in Oregon, a computer genius from Serbia, Daniel Jovanovic. They bonded over shared history, albeit decades and countries apart, of living in war-torn countries, carrying the same ever-questioning of authority. Daniel immediately appreciated what Brother David had to say and teach about, and said to him, Brother David, you, sh you should have a website to which Brother David said, yes, what's a website? <laughs> when Daniel described what the World Wide Web and websites were, Brother David said basically, well, forget about a website about me. How about one whose purpose would be to create a community of gratefulness, using the internet as a tool to bring people together? So together with friends Gary Fidel and Terry Pierce, they started putting that dream into action. They hired designer Linda Fisher, and together with Daniel's prodigious programming skills and Brother David's writing and creative ideas, they launched gratefulness.org on Thanksgiving 2000 under the umbrella of the nonprofit, the Center for Spiritual Studies. The Fetzer Institute has been key since the very beginning with grants to get the website started. And in 2001, there was a key gathering to begin the, the process of establishing the nonprofit, A Network for Grateful Living. And uh, like a week ago, I found this old report from that meeting, and I could not get over how it still resonates today regarding the needs of this world and how A Network for Grateful Living can respond to those needs. Here is some of what Brother David wrote in that report. What our world needs most is a unified worldview, a shared spirituality, like the one which gave to all creative periods in history their cultural cohesion and power to give meaning to the lives of individuals. Gratefulness is so universal an experience and at the same time so central and so powerful in transforming both individual lives and society as a whole that it can fulfill our contemporary longing for unity. At the core of many communities all over the world and as a driving force in many of the finest efforts, a rejuvenated spirituality is emerging which may well be characterized as a spirituality of grateful living. The task of our network for Grateful Living is not so much to make something happen, but to identify the many communities in which it is already happening and make them aware of it and help connect them, thus strengthening their joint impact. We do not need an additional community or movement, but rather a nerve center that connects existing ones and amplifies their shared energy. Our website, is a tool for the Network for Grateful Living in a twofold sense. It helps bring the networking about, and it serves the purpose of the network by facilitating an exchange of ideas and by giving online support to offline living. <laughs>